Is our speaker, uh, Dr. Matthew Physics. Okay. My pleasure to introduce Professor Brian Leroy uh, uh, from, um, he's a professor from the uh, University of Arizona. Uh, he received his uh, PhD from Harvard in 2003 and then did also training on that. He joined the uh, uh, faculty of uh, Arizona in 2006. Yeah, he's the uh, associate uh, editor of uh, APL applied to this webinar. Uh, so his uh, research interest is uh, uh, low energy material. Yeah, the, the mentor uh, used uh, for uh, his studies, uh, you know, uh, chemical uh, microscopy and uh, for, um, optical uh, spectroscopy. Yeah. And the material he has not been good at the color nanotube, the graphene, and the means, and so on. Yes, yes, he was welcome. Yeah. All right, well, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation to come here and tell you guys about some of the research my group has been doing. So uh, as uh, Professor Mao said, my group is interested in studying local electronic properties of materials. And this can be a wide range of materials from things like uh, quantum dots and carbon nanotubes to three, five semiconducting uh, materials. There's another nanotube example. Uh, but today what I'm gonna talk to you guys about is the work that we've done looking at local properties of two-dimensional materials. And so let me just start with then the, the sort of the beginnings here of two-dimensional materials. So the first 2D material, which was uh, or isolated, was graphene. And so this is a single sheet right, of carbon atoms arranged nicely in this hexagonal structure. And it was first uh, discovered about 40 years ago now, I guess exactly 40 years ago, a little bit more for uh, the paper that was received here. So this was the first uh, growth of graphene on a metal substrate, so growing a carbon monolayer on a nickel substrate. And so this was a paper in surface science about 40 years ago. And in the, that time, it's received something on the order of 400 uh, citations to the paper. But as you know, that graphene was rediscovered about 30 years after this, 25 years after that, uh, with this paper from uh, Novoslav and Geim, uh, where they took bulk graphite and exfoliated it down to monolayer, or in this case, a few layer thick films of it, and looked at the electric field effect in these materials. And so you can see in 2004, and this paper now has been cited something like 30,000 times. This is actually out of date. It's probably 40 or 50,000 now. And so you can see that, you know, even though this one came 25 years later, it had a much larger uh, impact, at least measured by citations. And so the question is, what's different about this exfoliated technique and these uh, materials in 2004 than what was first found uh, when graphene was being grown on the metal substrate? And the, the main difference is that by having it on an insulating substrate, like they had in this work, there's the opportunity to, to explore many more uh, new physics in it than when it was on the metal substrate and the electronics were sort of being dominated by the substrate. And so, uh, this graphene band structure then allows us to look at these massless Dirac fermions. We have this band structure in graphene, energy versus momentum here, where we have this linear dispersion relation. And so the energy scales as uh, linear in momentum. And so this be means that the electrons behave like photons. They behave like massless particles here, where the uh, speed of light is being replaced by the Fermi velocity here. It's about 1 300th the speed of light. Uh, in the graphene. And that should be contrasted with a typical semiconducting material here, which has a k-squared uh, momentum dispersion relation. So you have E versus k, you have a parabola, and you have k-squared. And so that's what sort of led to this, all this work on graphene, is the interesting new physics that come out of the fact that we have these massless uh, Dirac fermions. But graphene is not the only two-dimensional material. There's actually a whole series of other two-dimensional materials. And so graphene, we have this semi-metal massless Dirac fermions, but if we're interested in many other properties, we need to go and look beyond graphene to other materials. And so there are by now probably over 100 uh, two-dimensional materials, everything from semiconductors to metals, superconductors, insulators. And throughout the talk today, I'll talk about a couple of these different materials along with uh, graphene and how we've looked at the electronic properties of them. So in the semiconducting materials, we have the things like molybdenum disulfide, so band gaps on the order of one to two electron volts. 
Uh, there's superconductors, things like niobium diselenide. So as you cool that down, you go undergo a superconducting transition around seven or eight Kelvin. And then there's also insulating materials. And so an important one that I'm gonna talk about today is boron nitride. So this is a structure which looks very similar to graphene. It's a hexagonal structure, but instead of having uh, carbon atoms, you alternate boron and nitrogen atoms. And so the fact that you have this uh, broken symmetry, this BN, instead of carbon-carbon, means that instead of being a semi-metal, here you open actually a very large band gap because of the large difference, the ionic bonding in the boron and nitrogen. And so this is a substrate then that has a, a large band gap that we can put the graphene on. So all of these materials all have one thing in common, which is they all have very strong in-plane bonding. So the bonds here, the boron nitrogen bonds or the sulfur molybdenum bonds are very strong and they have weak outer plane bonding so that you can exfoliate them down to two dimensional materials. So we wanna be able to take them from the bulk three dimensional form and get down to the two dimensional counterpart. And so with this wide range of other materials, we're not limited to the sort of electronic properties that we have in graphene. We can actually envision many different uh, things like making transistors out of molybdenum disulfide. We can have flexible electronics. We can also look at things like optics. Here's photoluminescence from a monolayer of molybdenum disulfide. And so there, we no longer are limited by sort of the, the metallic nature of the graphene. We can use these other materials to make different sorts of devices, different sorts of applications. Here's an idea of making a multi-junction solar cell by combining a range of different two-dimensional materials, instead of being sensitive to only certain wavelengths of light, you can put a range of them here and be sensitive to a broad spectrum, like the solar spectrum, and therefore have a more efficient collection and therefore a higher efficiency solar cell. And so these 2D materials either by themselves or in combination with each other, hopefully will enable a wide range of electronics and optics applications. And so how in my group do we actually make these materials? So my group primarily uses uh, mechanical exfoliation to look at these materials. So we take bulk crystals. So here's a piece of graphite on a piece of scotch tape. And we're going to exfoliate them with uh, tape by just folding the tape over a couple times here to uh, divide it in half or four times, do it a whole bunch of times on the tape here and then put it down on a silicon wafer and then go find the model layers on these materials. And so that's the sort of the way that we're making it in the lab. Uh, you can also, of course, make it with other methods like CVD growth. So for graphene, we also occasionally will use uh, CVD growth to actually grow these materials. And so the way that this is gonna work for us is we have a tube furnace here. We put little pieces of copper inside the tube furnace. We flow a gas, normally methane gas and some and hydrogen flow it through the uh, tube furnace, heat it up to 900 Celsius or so, and then a monolayer of graphene will grow on the copper, and then we can dissolve the copper away in some sort of acid and then transfer the graphene to another substrate. And it's probably hard to see here, but there's a little piece of graphene here. This is a one inch optical window, and so we put a piece of graphene on here, which is something like a quarter of an inch or so. And so, in the previous exfoliation technique, we're limited in sizes to tens of microns, maybe 100 microns if you get very lucky uh, with the exfoliation. If we need much larger things, then we have to go to CVD in order to grow, uh, say, a millimeter or inch uh, size scale uh, graphene. And really, though, what my group is interested in is not just these single materials mm -hmm. by themselves, but actually making heterostructures and creating new electronic properties with the materials. Uh, sorry, uh, and so we also have the ability to grow other things like these TMD materials. Here's molybdenum disulfide, uh, tungsten diselenide. And so we need to have the ability to have the whole wide range of these materials so that we can then combine them together and to make new heterostructures uh, from them. And so here's uh, two of these. We can grow uh, the other two as well. And so the first step before we actually go about making these heterostructures is we need to identify the materials and, and look at how thick they are, how many layers we have, et cetera. And so the way that this is commonly done is just using an optical interference uh, technique. And so we have our two-dimensional material. We place it on a silicon oxide substrate with a silicon back gate, a uh, silicon uh, back 
a wafer. That wafer acts to reflect light. We shine laser downward here, and we look at the reflection through there. And then depending on the color of the reflected light, we can uh, figure out how thick the 2D material is on top. And so this is an example for graphene here. This is just the bare silicon oxide substrate over here. This is a monolayer of graphene, bilayer, trilayer, and four layers going on to the inside. And so very easily we can identify how many layers we have. Here's another picture, uh, not in black and white, of the same sort of thing. Silicon oxide, monolayer graphene, bilayer graphene, trilayer graphene, and four layers of graphene. For graphene, we're interested in those few layer pieces. For boron nitride, which we're going to use as our substrate for our material, we're interested in slightly thicker materials. And so here, this is an example of a boron nitride a piece, which is on the order of 10 nanometers thick, having a distinctive sort of green color to it. Or uh, here's molybdenum uh, sulfide, a monolayer of that. And so we've now been able to identify all the different materials, how thick they are, and the last step in making these heterostructures before we get to interesting new physics is how do we actually assemble them. And so we're going to use this idea here of sort of using them as like Lego pieces. So we have all of the different materials which I've shown you, these four different ones, or the whole series of 2D materials, the whole zoo of them, the hundred uh, plus ones. And because there are van der Waals stacking between the layers, we can just arbitrarily stack one material on top of the other. Uh, there's, we don't have to worry anything about lattice mismatches, uh, any sort of uh, different which materials like to be on other ones. They, we can just put anything on top of any other material. And so we're just going to be able to peel each one of them off and stick it on, on any arbitrary one. And so the way that we do this in my lab is with a polymer uh, stamping technique. And so the idea is take the exfoliated, in this case, graphene that I showed you before. So we have graphene on silicon, silicon oxide wafer. We come down with a polymer uh, spun onto a stamp, come down into contact here and heat up the sample so that the polymer now will stick to the graphene. And then we slowly pull the polymer up and if everything goes well, then we pulled the graphene up on top of this polymer stamp. And so now we have the graphene uh, on a polymer stamp, and we can then go and, and assemble the next layer of the heterostructure. In this case, we're going to do it with tungsten selenide. We find a piece of tungsten selenide that we want to pick up. We bring this stamp with the graphene on the polymer uh, over. We need to align it on top of that so that they are on top of each other. Uh, both laterally and if we care about orientation, we also need to rotate the two substrates with respect to each other to do this matching. You bring it into contact, you heat it up, and either you pick it back up if you're going to assemble more layers, or if this is the last layer, then we will melt this polymer and leave everything on the substrate at the end here. And so you can make any arbitrary structure you want by just repeating this process through here in this right hand side, just continue that loop over and over again to, to create any arbitrary stack of materials that you would like. To see this in uh, picture form, this is the exfoliated piece of graphene here. When we've got the stamp in contact here, the graphene is right here. We've rotated it, you can barely see it. Once you've picked it up onto the polymer, it's a little bit more clear. You can see the little bit of clearer area here. That's the piece of graphene. Uh, that's on the polymer. This is the uh, piece of tungsten selenide. This, in this case, was just a bulk piece of tungsten selenide. These two images on the right-hand side, we have to align on top of each other. That's done here, and then you melt it, and then hopefully the graphene is on top of the tungsten selenide when you're done. And so that's the general process that we use uh, for making devices in my group. And as I said, we can pick any of these 2D materials, any arbitrary combination of them, and stack them <coughs> on top of each other. And so once that process is done, then what my group does is look at these with scanning tunneling microscopy. So we have a low temperature scanning tunneling microscope. It operates at uh, four and a half Kelvin in ultra high vacuum. And so this is a picture in my lab down in the basement here. Uh, inside here is this little part here where we have the STM, the actual head of the STM. So we have the sample up on the top and we have the tip underneath. So you can see the tip here with the sample on top. 
the sample is going to come up into place on the tip. On sorry, the tip is going to come up and come into tunnel contact with the sample. So the sample is fixed. The tip is on a coarse piezo positioning stage, and so the thing we have to do is we have to move this tip and land it on our uh, heterostructure that we've made. And so that's one of the tricks of this. These heterostructures that we make are on the order of five microns in size. And so you need to position this tip onto that heterostructure with about five microns or less of spatial resolution. And so it's not shown on here because on the back side, there's a camera that needs to look into to this STM and be able to help us align the tip onto the sample with that sub five micron resolution. Otherwise, uh, the tip will crash into the insulating substrate. So we need to make sure that we're landing on the conducting substrate uh, when we come in with the tip. But assuming that all goes well, then we have two different modes of operation that we can use. So we can use a topographic mode of operation. And so here we have our sample here, we have our tip, we're gonna scan the tip. We're gonna keep a feedback circuit on that keeps this tunnel current between the tip and the sample a constant value. And because that tunnel current depends exponentially on the separation between the tip and the sample, we can get a very high resolution image of the topography of the sample. And so this is an example image here in the bottom left corner of a uh, graphene on silicon oxide uh, substrate. So you can see the little uh, hexagonal lattices, that's the carbon uh, lattice there. And you can see a height variation on the order of a few angstrom. The second mode of operation we can use, instead of scanning this tip back and forth, we go and we sit at one fixed location. We turn off the feedback circuit. So we no longer keep the current constant, but we keep the position of the tip constant. And then we change the voltage between the tip and the sample. That changes the limit here of this integral. And so by measuring di dv, the change in the current with the voltage, we get a derivative of this current, which gives us access to this local density of states information. And so we can, uh, we can determine how many states are available for tunneling into as a function of energy. And so this is an example from graphene. This is density of states on the y-axis, energy or tip voltage on the x-axis. And you can see there's very low density of states near zero, and it linearly increases going away on either side. And this comes from the band structure of graphene. If you remember, the graphene has a band structure, which is a Dirac cone. So there's low density of states at the uh, bottom of the cone, which is right here. Going to the right is going up into the conduction band. Going to the left is going into the valence band of the graphene. And so we can either measure topography or spectroscopy. But the real power of the STM comes in being able to combine these two techniques together. And so here, this is looking at imaging of the local density of states in the material. So this is a larger scale image here. This is about a 30 nanometer image of uh, graphene on silicon oxide. If you go and zoom in here, you can see the atomic lattice of the graphene. This is the exact same area looking at the density of states in the sample at some energy. And so when you go and zoom in here and look at it, you see this pattern here. And that pattern is actually a different periodicity than what we see in the topography. So we're not just seeing the atoms here, we're actually learning something about scattering and, and other uh, electronic wave functions in the sample by looking at these density of states images. And so it turns out that these density of states in, uh, are about square root of three times longer, the wavelength here in this density of states, uh, because there were scattering from defects uh, in this graphene on silicon oxide substrate. So those are the basic techniques that we're gonna use here. We're gonna use uh, spectroscopy and topography measurements to probe the electronic and uh, density of states and also the topography of the samples after making these heterostructures. And so today, what I want to actually talk about in the rest of the talk is at least two experiments that we've done on graphene, where by creating heterostructures with graphene and other materials, we can enable new functionality in the graphene. And I'm hoping at the end to be able to also tell you a little bit about uh, new work we've done with tungsten selenide, where we've also created heterostructures and seen some interesting new uh, physics in that. And so the first part here, I want to tell you what happens when you put graphene on an insulating substrate. So the original work that I talked about earlier, the original graphene measurements were all done on silicon oxide substrates. And the reason for using silicon oxide was purely, I think, a matter of convenience. 
there was this optical contrast so you could see the silicon oxide on so you could see the graphene on silicon oxide so you have a 300 nanometer thick silicon oxide substrate and the graphene then became uh, visible on that and so then these were the original transport measurements from uh, Nova Sloff et al. Here, where you look at the conductivity as a function of gate voltage. This is the conduction band, the valence band on the left hand side, and you see it takes something on the order of 100 volts to go from the conduction to the valence band. And so, this is a sign that there's a lot of disorder in the sample. You need to apply a very large charge density in order to dope the sample. Uh, and then early work from Amir Yacobi's group here on scanning electron uh, SET measurements uh, looked at the substrate and noticed that there was a very large amount of charge fluctuations on the order of 10 to the 11 per square centimeter in the silicon oxide substrate. And so this disorder in the substrate is what's causing this uh, very wide uh, dip or very wide peak in the conductivity uh, in the graphene. And so also we looked at STM measurements. So this is on the micron scale. This is in the nanometer scale. We see the same type of thing here, that, that the silicon oxide substrate is really a very disordered substrate. It has lots of trapped charges in it and leads to a lot of disorder in the measurements. And so we wanted to move away from that substrate to some other sort of insulating substrate to improve our device quality. And so the uh, substrate that ev pretty much everyone now has moved to is boron nitride. So this was the first work uh, from Jim Hohn's group at Columbia looking at graphene on boron nitride. So this is 2011, I think, uh, nature nano paper. And so the reason for moving to graphene uh, for boron nitride was basically three different reasons. One is it's an atomically smooth surface. So before I showed you the SDM picture of the graphene on silicon oxide, we had several angstroms of roughness. That should not be the case on boron nitride. There's no dangling bonds, no charge traps, or at least very few of them in the boron nitride, unlike silicon oxide. So we expect to have much less charge disorder. And lastly, it's a good insulating material, wide band gap, six electron volts. So the expectation is that it doesn't have any effect on the electronic properties of graphene, right? So you can imagine putting graphene on some sort of metal substrate, you could get atomically smooth, you could get no dangling bonds, but it would not uh, be an insulator and therefore would, would affect the graphene electronic properties. And so what they saw when doing this is that already just in topography, this uh, peak was much narrower. So that means that it's a much flatter, smoother substrate. And then here is looking at conductivity versus charge density or resistance versus gate voltage. Uh, equivalent measurements here. And you can see this peak here is very narrow compared to what I showed on the previous slide. If you remember the previous slide was on the order of 100 volts to go uh, through the dip in the conductivity. So here we're resistance, one over the conductivity. But this peak now is on the order of a few volts wide. And so that's a sign that the disorder in this substrate, in this sample, is much less than what you see on the silicon oxide. And so we wanted to go and actually look at that with scanning tunneling microscopy, see if we could quantify the amount of disorder in these samples on boron nitride. And so to do that measurement, we're going to use the uh, spectroscopy mode of the STM, and we're going to take spectroscopy measurements at different points on our sample. And so at each point here, we go and we perform a spectroscopy measurement where we look at density of states as a function of energy or voltage. And what you'll see is a V-shaped curve like this, where this minimum tells us where the draft point is located, where the charge neutrality point in the sample is located. So you can imagine here, it's a little bit to the left of zero energy. Over here, it's a little bit to the right. And so we can measure how that moves around in the sample. And that's what tells us how much uh, charge fluctuation, how much charge disorder there is in the sample. And so we just go take our sample and measure these spectroscopy points at each position, just measure where the minimum is, and we plot that here. And so that's what's shown in this slide here for three different device configurations of graphene. So this is the original sort of graphene on silicon oxide type substrate. And so you see here, there's a very large variation. So something on the order of 100 milli electron volts, that's the shift here, is on the order of 100 milli electron volts going back and forth here. If instead you put about 20 nanometers of boron nitride, between the silicon oxide and the graphene, you can see it's gotten much uh, more white here. 
there's still some a blue pocket here and a couple little red pockets on the edge. So we still have some potential fluctuations. They are now larger spatially. Right? So this is now spread out more, but it's not as high in energy fluctuations. And that's because this disorder is coming from the silicon oxide substrate. And so there are trapped charges there. We've moved them 20 nanometers away from the graphene. And so there are like Coulomb impurities 20 nanometers away. Now they've gotten uh, basically 20 nanometers wide. And so that's why you see this thing have a characteristic about 20 nanometer width. But because there's just one charge, then the intensity has gone down by the same factor. And so we see that this is improved here using the boron nitride as a substrate. If you go to the next step, a little bit more complicated device, you put graphite between the silicon oxide and the boron nitride. Graphite is a metal, or at least a, a semi-metal. And so by putting that there, you actually screen out the charge is that are sitting in the silicon oxide. And if you go and repeat this measurement now on this kind of structure, if you look at the graphene, this is just about totally white here. There's essentially very little charge fluctuations uh, in the graphene when you have a graphite vacuum. Uh, in terms of sort of, if you prefer to think of it in terms of mobilities, uh, we go from a few thousand uh, centimeters squared per volt second to something on the order of maybe 100,000 here and maybe a million or a couple million here. Uh, so we get basically an order of magnitude, one to two orders of magnitude with each of these improvements. And it's a similar with the charge density uh, fluctuations. They're about two orders of magnitude smaller here with the graphite back gate. And so that's why if you really want the highest quality devices, you want to use a graphite back gate with an HBN uh, spacer between it to really get the, the intrinsic properties of the graphene. All right, so from this, it looks like you know, HBN is acting as the perfect substrate for graphene. It's having no effect. It's just cleaning everything up and making things much nicer. And indeed, if we go and look with high resolution image, we see exactly that. So this is now an image, a couple nanometer size of a graphene lattice on hexagonal boron nitride. If you compare that to the one I showed you before, which had these kind of bumps and uh, ripples in it, we can see we're getting really atomically flat substrate. But now if instead I go and I zoom out a little from this image, so this is a two nanometer image. If I zoom out here to something on the order of 10 to 20 nanometers, now I start to see that it's not quite so uniform. And what you'll see is that there's now a longer range periodicity here. So here, 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 those spots going across, or here you can see the dark spots on this one that have on the order of one nanometer periodicity. If you go zoom in here, the little tiny hexagons on the right hand image are the atomic lattice. And so this other larger scale uh, pattern is a more pattern and it's coming from the fact that we have the boron nitride underneath. And in particular, it's coming from the fact that there's a rotational uh, disorder, a rotational mismatch between the two layers. And so what I have here is I have graphene, uh, sorry, I have boron nitride in white and I have graphene in yellow. If I put them on top of each other, but with a twist between them, then I can get different more patterns. So here I put the uh, graphene with a five degree twist on the boron nitride. This is a 10 degree twist here. And you can see these periodicities here is a longer range periodicity for small twist angle. And this one here uh, gets smaller as I twist it further. And so if I go and actually look at what happens is I continually twist the two layers. Then I have a pattern that looks like this. And if I slowly twist them between there, as they come into alignment, you can see you get a very large more pattern. As you twist them uh, away from that, you get a short periodicity. And so you see here, we can get out to about 14 nanometers uh, for the length of the more pattern when we perfectly align them. So when they come right like that, it comes to 14 nanometers. You see it also goes through a, quite a twist. So the orientation of the more with respect to the lattice, it rotates around as you come into alignment. And so we've seen that uh, by looking at a bunch of different samples, we can actually see this more pattern by controlling the twist angle between the graphene and the hexagonal boron nitride. And so we go from here as a two nanometer, a six nanometer, here's an 11 nanometer more pattern. And it's pretty easy to work out what the wavelength that you expect for this more pattern. It's set by only two parameters. 
One is delta, that's the lattice mismatch between the graphene and the boron nitride. And then uh, phi here is the twist angle between them. And so you can see because there's this lattice mismatch, which is about 2% or 1.8% between the graphene and the boron nitride, that sets us to a limit here of 14 nanometers. It sets us to about 50 graphene lattice constants. It'll always repeat the pattern uh, between them. And so we've now seen that this has an effect, at least on the topography. We've also seen that it has an effect on the spectroscopy and the electronic properties of the graphene. And so we're going to use that to kind of create some kind of topological properties in the graphene. So in graphene, we have this Dirac cone like this, and we can look at electrons moving through here. Their uh, velocity is the derivative of the energy with respect to K. But there's also uh, a second term here, uh, which is the Berry curvature here from the band structure. Oh, I think we lost. Uh, so we, if we have the normal Hall effect here, we have an electron traveling through here. We have an electric field here. We put a B field, non-zero perpendicular graphene. The electrons will go through some helical orbit. And so they'll move to one side of the sample or the other. And then uh, from the Berry curvature here, that can give us, if it's non-zero, then we can have interesting effects in broken symmetry in the graphene. So this is the usual graphene band structure here that gives us these linear cones. But if we can break the sublattice symmetry between the two carbon atoms, if we can make them somehow inequivalent, then we can open up a band gap in our graphene. So instead of having the perfect cone, we can open up a band gap uh, in the band structure. And then if that occurs, then we'll have this Berry curvature, which is non-zero because it depends on the size of the band gap that we open. And so then the electrons won't just move with this uh, DE by DK, but they'll also pick up this second term here. And if that occurs, then we can have something uh, called the Valley Hall effect. So where we have an electric field, say to the right, we have a, uh, we have a zero uh, B field, and now electrons in one valley, the K valley, will be bent to the right, and electrons in the other, the minus K valley, will be bent to the left. And so in order to do this, create this effect here, we need to actually break this symmetry in the graphene. And so we want to see, can we use the boron nitride to actually break the symmetry of the graphene and enable uh, this Berry curvature effect in the graphene? And so the answer is that we should be able to do it with the boron nitride if we can make it match the graphene in a commensurate way. And so this is some work from uh, the Manchester group looking at the uh, transition from an incommensurate matching of the graphene and the boron nitride to a commensurate, where you actually match the lattices. And there's also been other work, uh, this is from uh, MIT group, looking at uh, opening up band gaps in the graphene, and also the Columbia group looking at the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, and what they've seen here is that essentially when you put graphene on boron nitride, that opens up a small band gap in the graphene. So on the order here, looking at about 20 MeV, uh, these are in uh, Kelvin, so these are also on that same order, about 20 MeV. So instead of per, uh, keeping the pristine graphene cone, there it opens up this small band gap here uh, from the interaction with the substrate. And so we want to explore why does that occur. And so to do that, we take our tip here and we measure in three different conditions. And so the way we do this is that we change the tunnel current between the tip and the sample. So if we use a very small tunnel current, that means that the tip and the sample are very far apart. So that's this case on the left-hand side. Very small tunnel current, tip is very retracted. If you turn up and use a very high tunnel current, then the tip has to come very close to the substrate to get that same amount of current. And then we're in this regime on the right-hand side. So these are three measurements all at the exact same spot on our sample. And this is the topography. You can see it changes from a nice kind of smooth thing here, a little bit odd here and very odd on the right hand side. And so we're clearly something is changing about the graphene HBN system as we change the tip imaging parameters. And so we want to look at that a little bit more closely. And so to do that, we want to actually look at what is the graphene lattice constant that we measure here. Is the graphene keeping its pristine lattice constant, or is it having some effect from the substrate underneath? 
And so we go in this little white box here in the corner, and we can go and we take a Fourier transform of that area, and you see these little black dots, which correspond to the graphene atomic lattice. And so we can measure those, and we can measure the graphene lattice constant at that point in that little box. Now, if we go and take this box somewhere else in the sample, go through the entire sample, we can measure changes in these lattice constants by just looking at the changes in these lengths of these vectors as a function of position on the sample. And so when we do that, we get an image that looks something like this. And so what you see is that the graphene lattice constant is changing as a function of position on the sample. So it's being measured in A over A naught, A naught being the pristine graphene lattice constant, so that's 1.0. And so what you see is along the red lines here, the graphene lattice is being compressed. Along the blue lines, it's being uh, expanded. And boron nitride has a 2% longer lattice constant than graphene, and so that means that in these center regions here, the graphene is stretching by 2%. It's actually matching the boron nitride in there. And then it's compressing around the boundaries uh, to be able to, to stretch in the middle like that. And so now if we go and look at this at different tip conditions. So what I showed you before was different heights of the tip above the sample. So this is three different tip conditions here. And we can look at what's happening to the amount of strain in the graphene as a function of these different imaging parameters. So this one is the tip on the left, the tip very far away. There's a small variation here between uh, different spots on the lattice. As the tip comes a little bit closer, there's a large variation. And if you get really close, you get all kinds of crazy uh, patterns can start to form. We've even lost the hexagonal symmetry uh, here because we're really pushing very hard into the graphene sample. And so we can understand this by just looking at what happens in this imaging process. And so when graphene here is sitting above boron nitride with the tip not present, the graphene wants to contract and expand in different regions depending on if the carbon atoms are sitting over boron or nitrogen atoms. So when the carbon is over boron, it wants to expand a little. When it's over nitrogen, it wants to contract. Now, when we bring the tip in, there's an interaction between the tip and the graphene, and that's an attractive interaction. And so then we will pull the graphene up off the substrate a little bit. And so if we are doing that over an area that was expanded, we re uh, release that a little and we go back to the pristine state. If instead you come down very close with your tip and push hard into the surface, then you're pushing the graphene into the substrate and that's going to sort of uh, make the, a larger effect, this expansion and contraction effect. And so when you push down here, then we'll have to really expand the graphene lattice uh, to match the boron nitride. Yeah. So, there, so in the middle where you mark that CD, so yeah. if it's uh, trying to match the hexagonal brown nitride, I mean, it's half of the atoms are sitting on N, right? They're not just sitting on B, they're also sitting on N. Um, no, it's, so it's like A, B stack. So, oh. so the one carbon is sitting over the center of the hexagon, the other is over a boron here. In this side on the left, one atom is over nitrogen and the other is over the center of the hexagon. This AA stack is where both carbons are over boron and nitrogen. Okay. And so that configuration also wants to contract. All right, so then depending on the situation here, we can change the amount of strain in there. And so then we did a simulation of what you'd expect, which matches pretty well with what we measured here. Uh, so that the, basically, that depending on the, the tip conditions, we can expand or contract the graphene lattice. And you can see in a case like this, this we, in central region, we're matching. That's why there's a band gap that's opening in the graphene, because it's matching the boron nitride underneath. So some carbon atoms are sitting over a boron, some are sitting over the, the centers of the hexagon. That opens up a small band gap in the graphene. And so this is what's being seen in the transport measurements is that this matching of the lattices uh, is what's changing the band gap. And to uh, look at that a little bit more, this was work done by a former student of mine after he left, uh, looking at these uh, same structures, but using a pressure measurement. So what we did with the STM was applying pressure very locally under the tip. 
what he did is used a, uh, uh, a pressure cell to change the, the pressure in the sample, so that changes the separation between the graphene and the boron nitride. That changes the amount of strain that occurs there. And what they saw here is that as they pressed them closer and closer together, the interaction got stronger between the graphene and the boron nitride, that there was more strain and therefore a larger band gap opening in the system. They reached up to about 50 MeV, which is the theoretically predictive value if you could perfectly match the graphene with the boron nitride. All right, so in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes here of the talk, I wanna tell you what happens when you put graphene not on an insulating substrate, but when you put graphene on itself and what new physics can emerge when you stack them together. And so here, the degree of freedom we wanna use is the twist angle. So we have two pieces of graphene and we have the ability to arbitrarily set the rotation uh, between them. And so we have two copies of these Dirac cones, which we are going to be able to displace the momentum space here by controlling the twist angle. So as you um, move the twist angle smaller and smaller, that will bring the cones closer and closer together in momentum space. And so we want to look at what happens to the electronic properties of the graphene when we do that. And so in order to make these uh, devices, unlike the graphene of boron nitride where we just took devices and randomly uh, made the alignments between them, we want to have a way of having a much more controlled rotation uh, between the two layers. And so the way that we do this is we take a piece of graphene, which is shown here, which is relatively large. So this one is about 50 microns uh, in length. And we come down with our polymer stamp and we pick up half of it here. So we tear it along this line here. So we have half of it on the polymer stamp and the other half we leave on the substrate. Then we take the substrate and we rotate it by a controlled amount. So here, We've rotated by a few degrees, and then we bring the stamp down and we pick up the second piece of graphene on the first one, and that gives us then a controllable rotation between the two layers. And so by uh, doing this, we can pick any rotation angle that we want between the two layers when doing this. And so when you put graphene on graphene, it's just like graphene on boron nitride, the lattice constant, same exact formula here, except now delta is zero because we have two of the same lattices. There's no lattice mismatch. And so this equation simplifies to something here, which only depends on the twist angle between them. And importantly, it actually diverges when phi goes to zero. And so you can make any arbitrary length uh, more a pattern that you want in here. And so here's a couple different examples. Now look at the size scales down here. This is a three nanometer size scale, so this is something on the order of five nanometer periodicity. This one is about 20 nanometer periodicity. This guy here is getting up closer to 50 nanometer periodicity. I think we've made ones as long as 400 nanometers uh, for the periodicity of them. And so that means that we're working down here at the very small twist angles with the very large rotation angle. And so here, this is what graphene on graphene, you can see it goes straight out and in. It doesn't rotate like the graphene on boron nitride. So the Moray pattern stays always aligned and it goes to infinite lengths when they become aligned with each other. All right, so what does this mean in terms of the electronic properties of the graphene? Well, as you move through space in this Moray pattern, there are different stacking configurations of the graphene uh, sheets on top of each other. And one possible stacking configuration is this AA stacking where the two sheets are directly on top of each other. So every carbon atom in the top layer is directly over a carbon atom in the bottom layer. And in that case, the electronic properties look very much like monolayer graphene. You have this linear energy versus momentum relationship. <clears throat> then there are the stacking configurations AB and BA where a carbon atom in one layer is uh, over the opposite one in the other layer, and then the second one is over the middle of the hexagon, and there's uh, the mirror image of that with BA here. And so those have a K-squared dependence here, but importantly, if you apply an electric field, that's gonna break the symmetry here in these cases, but not in this case. And so when you apply an electric field, you open a band gap in these two cases, but this guy on the left stays metallic. And so by applying an electric field, you break the inversion symmetry, 
and open a band gap in AB or BA stacks, graphene, but not in the AA stack. And so if we want to look at what can we do with that fact that we can apply an electric field and open a band gap, we can look at if you had a purely AB stacked uh, graphene sheet, if you apply an electric field with two different signs, so positive and negative on the left and the right hand side here, then that's equivalent to changing the stacking configuration from AB going to BA by having a constant uniform electric field because this guy is, is the flipped over version of the AB stacked one. And so when you do this, if, as you go across this one on the left, right, there has to be a place where you have zero electric field here. And so at that point, the graphene would stay uh, metallic. In our case, when we go from AB to BA, there's a region that has to be uh, different stacking there, which also would stay metallic in the electric field. And so uh, what is expected to happen is that the bulk becomes gapped here, and the uh, boundaries uh, contain conducting modes, uh, two of them moving in opposite directions along this boundary here. And so we want to look at that in our STM measurements. And so what we see is in this small twist angle, we naturally have this BA, AB, BA, AB regions going around here with an AA stacked region in the center. And the domain walls are shown by these dark lines connecting the AA sites. And so if we have two different stacking configurations with the domain wall between them. And so we want to look at whether we can have topologically protected states along these domain walls in this twisted bilayer sample. And so this is a sample which is a 0.25 degree twist angle. Uh, and so this is a very long moray pattern. You can see 50 nanometers here. This is something on the order of 100 nanometer periodicity in the sample. And so now if we go and we actually look at spectroscopy. So the color scale is the density of states. This is energy here. And the x-axis is the back gate voltage. We're tuning the amount of charge in the sample. So on the AB region here, this dark region on the bottom right is a place where we are opening up the band gap. And the density of states is going to zero. We're applying a larger and larger electric field. As we go to the right, we're opening a larger and larger band gap. On the AA sites, we have all kinds of things going on, states there. But importantly, there's no band gap opening. And along the domain walls, similarly, there are states along there, but there's no uh, band gap opening. So there's very different spectroscopy and different positions on the sample. And we're going to use that then to, to probe these topological states. So if we go and we actually look at the local density of states, so we take an image of the density of states as a function of position. If we go to a energy which is outside the band gap, so go to high energy in the sample, we essentially see a uniform density of states, except here on these AA sites, it's a little bit darker. And so the electrons are delocalized. They can be at any position on the sample when you are outside of the band gap. If you go and probe inside the band gap, so the A, B, and B, A regions are these dark regions here. They are gapped. So the density of states is low there. And what you see is along the boundaries connecting the AA, there's these two uh, lines and these are these topologically protected states which are living on the boundaries of the a b and b a regions connecting the different a a sites going around in the sample and so these only appear when you apply a large electric field so that you gap uh, the bulk of the sample and then they appear on the boundaries all right so you probably have heard about oh yeah sorry I'm curious, these two lines, yeah. so are, why, why are there two lines? Um, I think they are showing up basically on the edges of the domain walls here. So they're basically just staying on the two sides of the domain wall for some reason, not just in the center of the domain. I, I'm not exactly sure why they are spatially separated and not directly on top, but it seems to be that for some reason they want to separate and live on the edges. Uh, we think it might have to do with uh, some kind of scattering that's going on at the AA site. Um, because when, yeah, so they, they basically connect in here and then go around 
uh, in there. And so it may have something to do with that, but we're not exactly sure why. So you think that 20 nanometer is kind of the region where it switches over from AB to DA? Uh, yeah, so it, it's, yeah, so they, you can see in the topography it's about 10 nanometers wide. These two lines are right on the edges of that region. Um, another question? All right, so you may have heard about magic angle graphene. When you go to a particular twist angle, it, be, it can become uh, superconducting. And so this is a sample where we've seen, uh, looked at this 1.1 degree twist angle. And so this is the density of states in the color scale here as a function of density in the sample on the x-axis. This is energy that we're probing here. Uh, and it doesn't come through very well in this slide, but there's lots of uh, states that are moving all through here. If we just take a cut through here at the Fermi energy, we have regions of low density of states out here and a bunch of peaks in the center here. And we can identify some of these here uh, based on the, where the charge neutrality point is in the sample. So that's the charge neutrality point. This red line is where we put uh, four electrons per more unit cell. So that's uh, N0, so that's the filling of the first band. The ones in between are half filled and quarter and three quarter filled. At each of these points, there's little dips in the density of states. So that's the sign that there's beginning to be insulating states appearing there. And here's uh, over at negative one filling. And so I don't have the, the newest data in this talk, but we've gone and we've looked now at all of these points, look at what the wave function uh, for the electrons looks like at these uh, points. And so we see different patterns at different densities in the sample and the, the sort of orientation of the wave functions and, and uh, what they look like at the different twist angles uh, uh, all change here. And so we've been studying this. We are working on uh, finishing up a paper on that. I didn't want to put the slide in here and have it live forever on the internet. So uh, this is just some of the old original data here. Uh, happy to talk about it offline with uh, people. And so I think we're basically beyond, uh, we're basically at the end of the talk. So I won't tell you uh, too much about our work with uh, beyond graphene here, except to just show you uh, two slides here uh, in WSE2. You can do a similar thing in WSE2 that you can do in graphene. You can twist them on top of each other. Uh, and if you pick the right twist angles, you can have very interesting correlated states appearing. And so here, this is a three degree twist angle in WSE2. <clears throat> and we've now gone and looked at the band structure at this AA stacking, AB, BA, and this bridge sort of like was the domain wall in the uh, graphene case. And if you look at the density of states here, there are slight differences here. If you look at where the valence band edge is, it's moving in energy between the different spots on the sample. But the more interesting thing comes if you go and actually look at the wave functions here. And what you see is that the wave functions, when you're really in the, the valence band here, have these sort of hexagonal uh, or triangular patterns. But if you go right at the top of the band where there's actually a flat band in the WSC2, just like in the graphene, that there's this flat band that leads to all these interested correlated states, the wave function looks extremely different at this flat band uh, place in the tungsten selenide. It actually becomes localized as a hexagon around the edges uh, away from the AA site, whereas generally the electrons live on the AA sites in here. So this agrees with some theoretical predictions from last year in PRL. So my group has also been exploring many other combinations, which I don't have time to tell you about. Graphene on semiconductors. So this is graphene on tungsten selenide. Graphene coupled to superconductors. So this is graphene on niobium diselenide. So these dark spots here are vortices in the niobium diselenide and how they interact with the graphene. Uh, you can put graphene on topological insulating materials or on charge density waves and look at how those uh, it, the interplay between the different states in the, say, topological insulator with the Dirac fermions in the graphene. And so today what I've tried to tell you about is how by playing with materials and ordering of the materials, the twist angle between them in particular, and also the inner layer separation as you push or pull the samples apart, we can modify and tune the degrees of freedom, modify the electronic properties in the materials. 
And really, this is none of this work is done by me. It's all done by the students in my lab. Uh, and so most of the work on the twisted bilayer was done by Chong, who graduated and has moved on to a, another uh, position at ASML. Uh, the earlier work on the graphene boron nitride was done with by Matt Yankowitz, who was a grad student in my group who then uh, is now a faculty uh, member at Washington. Uh, current members of my group, uh, Ziming and Rachel are the working on the, uh, Ziming on the twisted WSE2, Rachel on the twisted bilayer graphene in my group. Uh, Alex is doing some other optics measurements, which I didn't talk about, and Will uh, is very helpful making samples in the lab. Lots of collaborations with other people, and thank you for your attention. Very nice talk, thank you. So uh, we both have people online and people in the room who are free to ask any questions. Yeah. Um, so I, wa I wonder, um, so if uh, you measure the transport property in emitting such a state of twisted graphene, how does it look like? Yeah, so unfortunately I think there's, there's nothing super interesting <laughs> in the transport. Um, in this state in the middle. Um, um, yeah. so it will be uh, behave like localized? Or no, because it actually conducts. Could, yeah, I know, right? but, but it could have an interference, right? The wave function. Uh, uh, maybe if you got a small enough device. If you, mm -hmm. on the macroscopic, mm -hmm. several micron device. So what you actually expect is it's bilayer graphene, you're applying an electric field. You actually expect it to become insulating because you expect to open a band gap. Yeah. Yes. In fact, though, it stays conducting because of these because channels. Of this domain, uh, the domain because of the domain boundaries. Because the domain boundaries. And they go, conducting. right, so the electrons just head through it nicely. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd hope that you could get some kind of interesting valley mm -hmm. effects, but it doesn't work out mm -hmm. correctly. They, they circulate mm -hmm. such that you can get both K and K mm -hmm. prime valleys mm -hmm. to go through the sample. So, um, yeah. So I'm a going to make a comment and then yeah. a question. The comment is related to Chang's question. Is a, you know, these are several nanometers, right? Mm -hmm. So in a normal sample, you always measure a network. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. all the interesting facts kind of wash out because mm -hmm. of the language of the big network. Mm -hmm. However, there are a couple of papers that I can point out mm -hmm. where people have tried to make mm -hmm. small-ish devices mm -hmm. And have seen a bit of interference. I'm thinking of Clausen's work mm -hmm. and, and others who have tried to sort of shrink the area to make something out of it. But it, it, it is somewhat difficult because we're after all looking at you know several nanometer scales. I mean, ideally, you would get very small twist angles, right? So we we did get one at one point where we had like 400 nanometers between these nodes. So then you could imagine that you know you make a one micron device and it's starting to work, but those devices are actually very difficult to not have them go to perfect Bernal stack graphene. So my, my question is uh, uh, related to the magic angle sort of thing uh -huh. you showed. So from STM, sort of what is the bandwidth we're seeing in, at the magic angle? Right? So it's a nearly flat. It's a flat band. How flat is the flat? Um, I don't know if this shows it very well. Yeah, it's the color scale is really bad on here to see it. Um, so the flat band is occurring like right in here um, in the middle. I believe it's on the order of 10 milli EV. 10 to 15 milli EV. Um, I can offline, I have, I, I have the numbers in another uh, graph. So it's some, somewhere on that order. It's not like super flat though. Uh, it's still fairly wide. I mean, you can see these two band, these two here are, are what become the two flat bands when they come uh, down here. <laughs> Do 
you showed a formula to calculate the periodicity of, of the wavelength of molar fringes per by the Brafinov Brafinov experience. Yeah. Then you translate that formula to more like EMP system, which is a tungsten selenide or Brafinov tungsten selenide. Uh, does the formula stay same or more in generally? Uh, does does the periodicity get complicated by the fact that you have more atom atom layers than just one layer, like it goes in perineum? Yeah, so for the TMD ones, we just look at like the the, the metal uh, like matching, you know, say metal with the carbon if you do graphene on TMD or something. And then the formula, you can just use the exact same yeah. formula. The lattice mismatch just becomes like 30% instead of 2%. Oh, so um, you, you, you look at the copper and light, metal lining, not Yeah, uh, and then for the Twisted WSE2, that is the exact same as twisted bilayer graphene. Um, so same exact formula for that one. Many of the STM, so we always need that probe for ROM as a QRT. Yeah, so there's always a connection to the sample. So the current has to flow out somewhere. So there's always electrical contact to the graphene. Um, so on the graphene ones, we just make contact with the graphene. On the tungsten selenide that I talked about at the end, there's a graphene layer underneath that we go run the current through. I have one But the twisted bilayer, you said you, to, to make the twisted bilayer, I think you have to pay it one more. Mm -hmm. How do you exactly pay it? Um, so use a boron nitride. Uh, so you first pick up boron nitride on the stamp, and then you use that the edge of the boron nitride, you cover only half of the piece of graphene. So then the graphene wants to stick to the boron nitride, but it doesn't want to stick to the part that's not under there. And so then when you pull it off, it will rip. It's a little bit of a violent process, so it kind of, so you'll see, I think, in the numbers, I think I put some, there always ends up strain when you do this because it's very difficult to keep the graphene nice and flat when you're doing this violent ripping process. And so there's always a one degree of 1% one or so of strain after ripping it. Our online community is a little quiet today, but uh, are there any other Questions from the local audience? Maybe just one more on the uh, bed gap opening when you put graphene on the end. Yeah. So, in order to use that on site interaction to open, you need to line up this hydrogen or boron. Yeah, I guess so. Right, so, so I agree with something. You, yeah, I mean, you need to. Um, you need to have a small twist angle between them. If you right. put a large twist angle, then right in space, that coupling of graphene or carbon over boron or carbon over nitrogen varies quickly, right. and then essentially yeah, you get nothing. Right. So you have to align to Seems do it. Seems like the graphs were were they going to zero when the more uh, lattice uh, becomes very small, or because there were a couple graphs showing there. It seems like uh, they were not going to, or maybe it's just measurement uncertain. So. The, the problem is that the, for the, from the transport measurement. Yeah. So in transport beyond, I think it's about two degree twist angle, you have no idea what the twist angle is. Because the way that you measure the twist angle in transport is you look for some satellite resistance peak when you fill the more You can't reach that. If that more is really tiny, you can't put enough charge density to fill it. And so, they, the transport measurements are over a very small range of twist angle. So it's very hard to say whether they do extrapolate to zero or not because it's like, you know, one fifteenth of the range of angles that they can measure. But physics wise, you wouldn't. Physics wise, I would expect it to go to zero. Hey, wonderful. Let's thank the speaker again. I'm going to read it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, have you had a lunch?
I saved I saved myself some pizza, but I didn't uh, eat it yet before. No, it so it's from me sitting over there. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah.